All right, let's open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. Page 71, if you have a Bible in the pew. Genesis chapter 35. All right, Genesis chapter 35, starting at verse number 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, and go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments, and let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of of Jacob. So I'd like to preach a little message here uh, this evening titled Household Instruction. Household Instruction. Now the Lord, He's, he's been laying a lot on my heart lately. Um, I must have gotten at least six sermon topics just laying on my bed at night and, and just through my daily reading and stuff. I believe the Lord's really been uh, been dealing with me on, on some things and it's just a matter of now studying those, those, those topics out. You know, it's like, it'd be good if the Lord just gave me just a whole message, you know, everything formatted, everything already, you know, done for me and everything. But now I got the, I got an idea of something, of a lot of things actually. Now I got to put some time in on myself and do some studying and praying about them and structuring them and all that. But I, I do believe the Lord's <clears throat> uh, leading me to do a series soon on, uh, titled The Home. Um, and I believe that'll be a good one. Uh, it, you know, it, getting into kind of some marriage counseling and, and the family. I know we covered a lot of that in First Corinthians, but uh, this is it's probably going to be a big study. So um, I know there's a lot of going on in my family and stuff like that too, and uh, I, I believe that'll be a blessing to all of us. So um, what I'd like to talk about tonight is a, a basic thing of household instruction. There's nothing nothing too crazy tonight. Nothing real far out, and I pray that we can get a blessing from. Uh, that I may say something that, that that we need that would help us with our relationship with the Lord. Um, so what Jacob said there in this passage, okay, he said to his household, and that's something that we can certainly apply to us today for instruction in righteousness, okay? Jacob, he, he said that to his household. Now, if you come to Ephesians, if you come to Ephesians chapter number 2, I'm going to go a little bit quick. I got a lot to cover. So if you can't, Get the get to the verse. Well, you got to write it down and go home and read it. But Ephesians chapter two, verse number nineteen. I like what Paul says here. He says, "Now, now, right now, okay. If you're in Christ, if you're saved, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Strangers and foreigners to what? You know, you get in this context. It's the Commonwealth of Israel and stuff and." getting into some of the blessings and some of the promises um, of Israel, you know, for, for salvation is of, of the Jews. We're no, we're no more strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, the household of God, okay? So I like these instructions. You keep a bookmark in Genesis. Jacob gives, uh, Jacob, number one, he's the man of the house. He's the man of the home. I like verse number two. It says, "Then, then Jacob said unto his household." Now that's uh, you know, step on people's toes, but the man gave the command. Okay, not the wife rolling a house or nothing like that, but the, the the man of God, Jacob, he gave the command. Jacob said unto his household. Okay, number one, for household instructions, the first thing that we ought to do, okay, is put away strange. Gods. Put away strange gods. So people say, well, you know, I don't worship statues and I don't bow down to images and I don't make shrines and light candles and have all these 
pictures on my wall of, of whatever God and deity and things like that. Well, you know, so on. All right. But what about worshiping, you know, put, or putting away the strange God, which is yourself? Okay, now, one of the first temptations presented by Satan was, um, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And no doubt that that temptation is still present today. Ye shall be as gods. And we know this in the last days that perilous times shall come. And what's the very first thing that Paul lists on perilous times? Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. And then later on in the passage he says, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Um, now you think about that. How many times do, have we put our own will over our Heavenly Father's will? How many times have you know we put our words above His own words? Um, you know, we when we get ourselves in a in a mess when we try to run and dictate our lives. And when one of the verses I couldn't remember it, um, I remember searching for the you know going, going through the book of Proverbs, and I, you know I didn't know what to do with my life. I didn't know what my calling was, what the Lord wanted me to do, and He He led me to Proverbs five six. It says, "Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways." are movable that thou canst not know them. You know, we always like to have things set in stone. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to get married, I'm going to have this many kids, I'm going to have this house, I'm going to do this, and all these things like it's just set in stone. And I'm going to go by my schedule and that's it. But life is movable. Her ways are movable. Things change. Things come up. Illnesses, deaths, and, and finances, and whatever. Things get brought up in our life. But a lot of times we, we still try to you know, run our own lives like like we're some type of God. And don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not saying you know everybody has is a, a spark of divinity in them, or everybody. You know, I'm just in a practical sense here. I'm not saying that everybody is you know is gods. Even the devil said as gods. But there's all there, there's a lot of strange gods that we ought to put away as Christians, and uh, one of them is is uh, money. Okay, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now I always underline the word the love of money. Okay, because obviously we need money. Okay, we need to pay the bills. We got you know feed ourselves and pr provide for the family and stuff like that. But loving it, okay, because you love it, you set up the money as a god. That's why Jesus Christ said uh, in one of the verses, He said, uh, "If you not serve two masters, you cannot serve God and Mammon." Which is who? It's a false god. Mammon is the god of the god of money, the false god of money. So uh, this, that, that strange God may, may make you serve him so much that all you think about is money, okay? You, you're, you, money's constantly on your heart, and how am I going to get this done? How am I going to do this? And, and then, you got, and then what, what that false God will do is then it gets you in a bunch of debt. You, get, you open up this credit card, and get, and next thing you know, you're, you're, you're flooding in debt, and you've got to work, and you've got to work, and you've got to work. By the time you know it, that, that God like, controls your life, and it's a false God, so it's, it never has anything good in return. If you set up money as an idol, as a god in, in your heart, um, you know, and, and when, when I think about all that stuff, you know, that, that mentality, I got to have this, and, you know, I need this, and I can't live without this. I always think it, what helps me with that is it's just a bunch of stuff. I don't know if that's a man's way of thinking about it or whatever. It's stuff. It's things. <laughs> that's all it is. You know, that's like, even, you know, if um, I like to reduce anything that is of a high value to just things and stuff, you know. Okay, my, you know, my, well, my 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 uh, wedding ring. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, that's a good thing. But it's it's still it's a it's a it's a thing. I'd like to put a little adjective before you know, a little special stuff that's sentimental to me and stuff. My wedding ring, you know, my wife's wedding ring and stuff. But it's that's the you know you can't set up money as an idol as a god in your heart. And all the things and all the, the stuff that, that we collect, okay, and that they become like a false god uh, that, that rolls us and guides us and stuff like that, which is no good. Now, come to Galatians chapter 1, verse 9. Another thing that you may set up as a god in your heart, you know, and, and it, it's almost like yourself, you know, like you're, you're a false god, and uh, you try to take orders from yourself and things like that. And then Galatians chapter 1, verse number 9. Uh, you may set up, you know, your social reputation as a god, and um, you know, trying trying to please others uh, while you know the things that you, that you're doing aren't pleasing God, you know. And that's John Paul hit that, you know, very well on his couple of sermons on, you know, the main thing of why we don't witness to people is the fear of man and things. And 
um, you know, we have to have this certain image, you know, this, this social image that we uphold and we don't want to offend people and, um, you know, also, you know they, 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 they think that, you know, we're, we're rude and we're mean and stuff like that. But look at Galatians 1 verse 10. Paul says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So we got to be careful, and we, you know, we we can only please so many so many people without going too far and compromising and stuff like that. Um, so uh, all of us here have some things in our life and and influences that influence and guide our decisions that are not of God. Okay, so I think it's it's an it's especially a strange thing when a saved person sets up strange gods uh, in our in our hearts, considering that we have Christ dwelling inside of us. And yet, at the same time, it's like a Christian can have strange gods. And I, I even underline that word, strange, because that's such a strange thing. Because those strange gods never done nothing for us. You know, I don't care how much, how much money and how, you know, you hear that even with Hollywood people. They got everything. They got money. They got fame. They got car, all this materialistic stuff. And they're, at the end of the day, they're still empty. They're still hooked on some type of antidepressant or whatever. And... That don't fulfill them, you know. And uh, it's strange when we set those types of things up in our hearts um, that, that they may, you know, fill some type of void or whatever that we have. That's Christ is in us, okay. That's all, that's all that we need. He's sufficient. And um, it's either when Christ is in us, it's either Christ is on the throne, okay, rolling and reigning over us, or it's the other way around and we're on the throne, and then Christ is standing, you know, standing next to us or bowing at our feet or whatever. That, that's a horrible, disgusting thought. When we kick God off the throne, trying to roll and reign uh, in our hearts. And one of the old sayings was, uh, you know, the, the resident should be the president. And that's a good one. You know, the resident that's indwelling inside of us, he should be the president. Be leading and guiding us and keep, keeping him, you know, first and foremost in all of our aspects of life, okay? Now, the household instruction, number one, is to get rid of, of our false gods, get rid of them, and only serve the one true and living God. The rest of them are dead. The rest of them are fake. The rest of them are strange. Uh, we got to get rid of them. Okay. Now go back to Genesis. Genesis 35. All right. Household instruction number one: put away the strange gods that are among you. And this is good. This, I like Jacob. You know, he's a, he's a man of the house and he's, he's getting his, his family in order. He's telling them, look, number one, we got to get rid of these fake gods. We got we to gotta get rid of them. We got to serve the one true and only God. We got to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy strength, all thy soul, all that. God got to be number one. Put away the strange gods that are among you. Number two, the next instruction to the household is be clean. That's a good one for parents to talk about their kids. Keep your rooms clean, stuff like that. Be clean. All right, we're going to talk about this both ways, physical and spiritual. Now, if, if we come to Ezekiel real quick, Ezekiel, no, you know, no, nobody likes, um, I ain't going to lie, was, I watch that show, The uh, Hoarders, okay? And, uh, and it, you, know, when I, you know, when I come to, come to conclude, a lot of those people on that show, um, they're Christian. They're Christian. They're praying. They got a cross around their neck. They got a picture of Jesus in there, and it's 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 interesting. But you look around, and God does want some order and some structure in, in our in our homes and stuff like that. And and that's that's good because you know you you live in a place that's that's bombarded with garbage and, and uncleanliness. And I'm talking like like filth, filth. You know, I'm not saying like you know messy or garage is messy or whatever. But they're laying in it and stuff, and that's that's no good. A, a child of God doesn't God don't want you living in in in, in piles of filth like that and stuff. So there's a there's a basic thing on just to to be clean, you know. And you could see in the, in God's chosen people to the Jews, God's concerned with their with their cleanliness. You know the Bible the Bible verse, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, that's that's not in the Bible. That's just one that people make up. But the the principle in a sense is found. God wanted His people, God wanted His people to be clean. I fell for that too one time. I said, yeah, that's a good one. That makes sense, you know. That's in that's in Hezekiah chapter five or something, you know, one one of those. But be clean. So God, He was concerned about His people, Israel, being clean and stuff like that. But you you come to uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter fourteen, 
Ezekiel chapter 14, verse number 3. Ezekiel 14, 3. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. All right, like we talked about, the idols, the false gods, the income, the social status, the cars, the houses, the lands, the ministries, all that stuff. They set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block. Now, what's a stumbling block? That's just something you're tripping and falling over. It's like a wall. It's like a block that's hindering you to get closer to the Lord. There's something in your way and you're tripping and falling over it. What is it? The stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? You know, the Lord ain't going to have much relate, you know, much communion, much we ain't going to much fellowship with them if we got a big roadblock, big stumbling block of our iniquity there. And I like what Peter says, you know, how Ezekiel says, you know, setting up idols in, in the heart, okay? And in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, it's a good reminder of what Peter tells us. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And I like word that, sancti that sanctify, sanctification is a setting apart. Setting apart, spending time, okay? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Make room for the Lord in our hearts. And you know, there's other things we mentioned in, in just Ezekiel there. They fill our hearts. So the Lord's trying to come in and you got so much other business, so much clutter and stuff that's inside of our heart. There, there's no room for the Lord to come in our hearts and, and, and stuff like that. So um, come to 2 Corinthians 16. 2 Corinthians 16. So you got to cast out the gods and the idols and fill your heart with the things of God. And, uh, you know, no dentist doesn't ever just drill out a cavity and just leave a big gaping void there. They fill it with something. They fill it with the, you know, with the right material or something. You don't just dig, you know, you're working or something. You don't just dig a big hole and that's it. And just leave the hole there and stuff like that. You're putting a footer or you're digging for, you know, a post or something. You just dig a hole and that's it. But you fill it with the correct you fill it with the correct material, the right stuff, the right substance that's correct for that job. Now, I know that we're not under grace, or we're not under the law today. We're under grace. But uh, you know, as we read in the Apostle Paul, he gives us a lot of New Testament commandments. Uh, they're, they're not suggestions but, or his opinions, but they're New Testament commandments okay, that we ought to follow. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse uh, 17, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. The Lord don't want you to be unclean. He wants you to be clean. Okay, and that's one of the commandments Jacob gave his household, be clean. All right, on the outside, all right, and on the inside, you know, spiritually, morally, and physically and stuff. Be clean. Um, Wherefore, come off from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Uh, and and at the, then the rest of the verse says, and I will receive you. Okay, in, in, in the sense of I will receive you in, in fellowship, in practical fellowship, in, in communion with him. Okay, um, so we ought to be clean. Now, you say, how in the world... Do I stay clean? Well, the Bible has all the answers for that. Okay, look at John 15, verse 3. 15, 3. And if you ask the everyday person, you know, do you want to be clean? Most people would say, yeah. Most people, they, they could agree with that. Yeah, I do want to be clean. But they don't know exactly how. They may not have to cleanse themselves physically, but they don't get the spiritual part. And the spiritual part is always more important first before you get to the physical part. So, how in the world do I stay clean? Look at John 15, verse number 3. Jesus Christ says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How do you get clean through the word of Jesus Christ? You've you got to have God's word. You've got to have the word of Jesus in order to cleanse us. And that, that's, that, that principle is found in the book of Ephesians 5.26. Ephesians 5, 26, Paul says that he might sanctify and cleanse it 
Talking about husbands, love your wives. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And one of the, ba you know, a basic thing, every, every single day, you know, I don't, you take a shower in the morning, a shower at nighttime, whatever, as often as you feel need to, to cleanse, cleanse your flesh and clean your body, even more so you should have that need to want to cleanse your spirit. Paul says somewhere, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians or something, I don't got that verse written down, but uh, we got to cleanse all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. I mean, we're living in America. It's hard to just walk down, go about our daily business without getting some type of dirt and grime and filth on us. Something's bound to rub off, you know, and I don't know about the whole topic of unclean, unclean spirits and stuff like that. And I believe a, a demon or a, a, a Christian could be demon possessed in a sense that a devil could possess, you know, your mind and possess your, your, your belongings and possess certain things of you. And I, I know Christ is in us and he, uh, you know, he, he that's in you is greater than, uh, um, greater than all, you know, greater than the world and all that, but I believe that a devil could jump on you in a sense. You know, you're walking through just America, you're bound to get an unclean spirit or two to, to try to, you know, cling on you. Okay, you can't get your soul, but it may be able to get a hold of your, your mind and stuff like that, and your, your spirit, the spirit of man and stuff. So we got to cleanse ourselves from all, all them dirt balls that are trying to, to, to cling on to us. Now, uh, Psalms 119, this is one of my personal favorites. When I first read this thing, when I got saved, not, not too long after, I was like, "That, that is it. That's that's the one of the greatest verses. Really spoke to my heart. And I'm sure a lot of other people's hearts, growing up, you read this verse a time or two. Look at Psalms 119. Let's see here, verse number nine. Psalm 119, verse number nine. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How in the world is a young man going to cleanse his way? And I know a young, a young man, a young woman, you, you, like, you know, you're almost guaranteed to get some type of dirt and filth on you, you know, physically and, and spiritually, morally, all that. You know, you can't even go outside and breathe fresh air without getting a dose of chemtrail on you or some type of whatever metals and iron floating around and dirt just floating in the air pollution and stuff you can't even breathe fresh air without getting getting dirty so uh like i said it, throughout our daily routine it, we're bound to get something some dirt onto us so there's advice here wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way and, and we ought to want that all right well how do how do you cleanse our way how do we cleanse our way lord by taking heed thereto, okay, according to thy word. We had to pay attention to God's word. That's the, that's the only way um, in order for us to really get clean, to really clean our hearts, to really, you know, cast out those false gods and, and, and stuff. But you got to cleanse. You got to renew your minds daily. I mean, I can't stress enough to uh, just stay in the book and get a daily reading plan. You know, and like, like I would to God that we would esteem, esteem the words of God above our necessary food, like Job said. You know, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And, um, you know, the, the wrong kind of friends, the wrong kind of relationships, the, the wrong kind of habits uh, makes it even worse. And you've got to even do even more of a deep clean, a, a deep cleansing. That's why I like it. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? That's the best time to cleanse your way when you're young. You know, to try to try to stay clean, you know, get get clean while you're young and try to live a good, clean life. Because when you get older, it's harder to, I mean, geez, you got to scrub and scrub and scrub. And sometimes there's just be, there's things, there's habits you, you know, they're like ingrained into your character for a long time. So that's a great advice for uh, for a young man and a young woman is to pay attention to God's word. OK, now, first Peter Chapter 1, we know this, this commandment, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 16. Uh, I believe it says, Be ye holy, uh, be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Holiness is a type of cleanliness. It's a type of sanctification. It's something that's set apart, something that's consecrated. Uh, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, how how do we how do we be holy? What's part of uh, what's what's part of holiness that, that 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 we need? Let's look at First John here, First John 
1 7. 1 John 1 7. We've got to cleanse ourselves by the word, and you know, no doubt we're going to sin, we're going to struggle, we're going to get dirty. And we need to go get, just about every, we get dirty, we sweat every day, you need to get a shower every single day. You know, say, I'm going to get a shower once a week and I'll be all right, I'll get a shower every Sunday or something. You know, every day you get clean and you got to keep in that routine, okay? And here's part of the routine of staying clean, part of the routine of staying holy. 1 John chapter 1, look at verse number 7. 1 John 7. But if we walk in the light... You know, trust and obey. You know, if we walk in the light, the light of His Word, the light of Jesus Christ, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, look what comes first. We have, what comes after that? If we're walking in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We have fellowship, we have sweet fellowship, just all of us. We have fellowship with the brethren, okay? Fellowship one with another. With another. And look what also does the cleansing. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, Cleanseth us, cleanseth us from all sin. The word helps us stay clean. And by, by claiming the blood, look at the next verse, verse number 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. There's going to be some sin on us. There's going to, it's going to rub off on us. We're going to you know, develop a bad habit. we got to get shaken off and, and, and scrubbed off and stuff. And there's, there's going to be sin in our life. If we say we have no sin, we deceived ourselves, the truth is not in us. Then verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, you know, this ain't a sense to get saved, but once again, this is for our fellowship. This is part of staying holy, staying clean. Confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, you got to go continually do that every single day of your life. Pray and confess. Lord, dear God, I did that. You said, I don't know what I... Yeah, you know what you're doing. You know exactly what you're doing. And, and say that thing as much as you possibly can. Um, that's an, another study I got. Lord laid on me is just prayer. And that's such a basic, basic thing that we all ought to take more serious is prayer. But um, come to, come to uh, Psalms 51 before I get off on something else. Psalms 51, verse number 7. On this topic of cleansing, Jacob told his household, you got to be clean. Look at Psalms 51, verse number 7. Psalm 51, verse 7. Look what David says here. Psalm 51, 7. Now remember, this is David. This is a psalm of confession after committing adultery. All right, David, he's in, in sinning, you know. Uh, Look at verse number 4 even, you know. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. David says, I acknowledge my transgressions, of, of the verse number 3, and my sin is ever before me. And that sucks sometimes, you know, uh, just sins of the past get brought up, or your, your sin, you, your, it's ever before you. It seems it's always, it's always there, it's in your mind or something. David, David says, verse 5, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. I like that. In the, uh, in the hidden part. Now, Paul gets that full revelation of Christ in you. You know, uh, like Paul says in, Rome, in Romans chapter 7, you know, with, with my mind, um, I, I'm, I, I serve, you know, or with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. But in my mind, in my soul, I serve the law of God. It would be two natures there. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Then verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Well, that's why I like that old hymn too. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Purge me with hyssop. Now what's that? That's a, I had to look that up. I didn't know what that was. Hyssop was a small, brush-like plant. A small, brush-like plant in Israel. I suppose that thing got a lot of properties and essential oils and all that. Um, it's mentioned in connection with the Passover. And the Israelites used it to spread blood on the door frames of their homes. And uh, later it was used to sprinkle blood on the tabernacle to dedicate it to God and on people with skin disease so they would be cleansed. So there's a cleaning with this hyssop. Now hyssop and in blood in cleansing and forgiveness go all together. Okay, that's what I like about that passage. So 
You know, David's plea to be cleansed, to, to be cleansed with hyssop uh, is like saying, Lord, wash me in the blood. Cleanse me in the blood. Confessing our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all righteousness. That's why we got to confess our sins. Now, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew 23, Matthew chapter 23, verse 26, a big warning here, and this is going to get on to our next instruction, but Matthew 23, 26, Jesus says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You've got to get the inside clean first. That's why it starts out getting rid of the strange gods. They're set up in the heart. Then be clean. And you know, that's what you, you see, you know, see people that are dressing aren't dressing right or people aren't acting right. You don't try to correct the outside first. You know, hey, take this off, hey, quit doing this, hey, quit doing that. You get them to Jesus Christ first. You gotta work on the 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 the, the heart. You gotta work on getting Christ in them in order to clean the inside first. That's an instruction from Jesus before you get to the outside. Okay? Now, um, we ought to be clean. Now, look at Genesis. We'll go back to Genesis. The next instruction, Genesis 35. Genesis 35. Put away the strange gods among you. Be number one. Number two, be clean. Number three, change your garments. Change your garments. Now, I'll take this phrase two ways. Physically, and spiritually. Now, first off, we'll talk about physically. All right, uh, you know, when when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, we definitely we know that we cannot use grace as an excuse to sin. Um, in other words, you know, if you if you dress like a whore, okay, then it's and it's right that you know that's a Bible word. People, you know, I said that one time, and people looked at me like, "What are you talking like that for?" You know, you shouldn't. That's a Bible word. I don't know if it's in your Bibles, but it's in my Bible. Okay, that's a that's the right word. If you're dressing like a whore. Uh, that's that's no good. You got to get you got to dress properly. Okay, um, and if you if you're if you dress immodestly, and you're a woman, uh, you know that's that's what the Bible would say. Okay, you're like a whore. And same thing with a guy. And you know if a guy he he just can't wait to take his shirt off and show his 20 inch biceps and go to the beach or go to the gym and just wants to you know just show off everything he got, then that's no good either. Okay, so it goes both ways. A woman dressed like a whore. And a guy, he can dress like a whoremonger. Okay, that's all, people, people, both ways go with that. Um, and we got to do God a favor, and we got to change our garments. We got to change our garments. And, um, you know, there's a reason why God did clothe Adam and Eve with coats of skin. He didn't let them walk around in that little, little fig leaf <laughs> forever. And walking out the garden with a fig leaf on. He says, what are you doing? There's thorns and thistles out there now. You got to get coat, you got to get dressed properly. Uh, people still ought to learn that lesson, you know, dress properly, put a coat on and stuff like that. Like, you look around, there's kids, no coats, and people are walking, I mean, it's Pittsburgh, I understand, but you're like, where, where what's wrong with people sometimes? You got to put some clothes on. Um, now, next, okay, if we're talking about the first thing, is um, when the Holy Ghost of God moves inside of you, okay, He'll tell you what to wear and what not to wear. You know, there, there should be modesty in the way that, that we dress, both as a man and a, and, a, and a woman. Now, when you're in your closet, okay, well, how about pray first? You go in your closet to go get your clothes. You open up your door, you're in your closet, you see all these clothes. Why don't you pray first? Well, isn't that, after all, what the closet's made for? <laughs> it's our prayer closet, you know, and you think about of all the places in our house that the Lord could have told us to pray, He picks our closet. Lord, why you, I spend time in the kitchen. I'm always at the table. I spend time on a sofa. I'm always on my sofa. Go in the prayer sofa. You know, next thing you know, you lay down and you're, you're sleeping on the prayer sofa or something. You know, out of all places in the house, he tells us to go to our closet. And you think about that. Why? What's so special about the closet? You know, things are, junk's in the closet. You know, clothes, how we, how we dress, how we appear to people is in our closet. Old things that we might have had since high school or whatever. We, we, we put them in the closet. Cleaning supplies, you know, they, they get put in the closet and stuff like that. And um, all that old stuff that, 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 you know, you have nowhere else to put it, you just jam it, you shove it in your closet, okay? And how about, you know, when you enter into the closet, 
Well, how about well, first we, you pray? Lord, you know, uh, God, does, does what I'm wearing, does it please you? And you'll find quick, you pray like that, the Lord will tell you, look, this just got to go, this got to go. Yeah, that's all right. And that's, you know, it's a little iffy. You might God, you know, put that one aside, go donate that or whatever. You, you'll get the answer on that stuff, okay? Um, if you, you know, if you did that every time, you prayed, Lord, dear God, what, you know, when you first got saved, Holy Ghost moved inside of you, Lord, what am I going to wear now? You'd be surprised at all that, how much scandalous clothes and stuff that you once had got thrown away, you know, because you prayed about, Lord, what do I wear? I got to change my garment and stuff. And, uh, but of course, you know, none of you ladies in here are like that. Or, so, you know, maybe may not be uh, preaching at you directly, but they're, they're, you know, somebody listening that um, knows that they got some, some clothes in the closet that defile the prayer closet. It's the prayer closet, you know. We think it's first and foremost just for our stuff and junk, but God t tells us that's our prayer closet, you know. So the the instruction is, you know, we ought to change our garments. He says, change our garments, and I, I thank God for good, you know, good mothers and fathers that told their son, son, you ain't leaving the house like that. Pull up your pants. You look like a thug. What do you What do you think? You're a gangbanger. Pull up your pants. You know, dress right. Get get take that take that shirt off and. You know, with them bad words on it and stuff like that, just put a T-shirt on, put a you know a sweatshirt, a flannel, whatever on. Change, change your clothes, son. You know, you look like a fool. You know, what are you, what are you trying to be? Man, I was. My dad had. Phew, you don't want to know what I. If you pull up pictures, what I how I tried dressing back in. Man, I was a little punk at the end of the day, and I gave my dad a hard time about stuff like that. And uh, you know, same thing with, with um. With, 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 a, with a mother and father or something, you know, with a daughter. You ain't leaving the house like that, you know. You see these little girls leaving the house and the dad standing next to him like, why in the world? That guy needs a, he's such a, what a creep. Leaving, letting his daughter go out in the house, you know, who knows how, 14 years old or whatever, dressing like, you know, like some hooker on the side of the road or something like that. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So a, a dad, a father, you got to look and say, you ain't wearing that. You know, you you got to have control about what that what that kid wears and stuff. And I don't know. I notice a difference when it comes to just walking through the store or something. And you know, look at kids' clothing. You know, I look at the boys' section. You know, maybe clothes for ten year olds or something. And they got you know little soccer balls on it and footballs and little dinosaur shirts and stuff like that. Ten year old boy clothes or whatever. And uh, you know, just kid stuff. You know, the boy boy clothes or whatever. And then you go and then you go down and you look in, in, in at the little girl clothes and stuff. And they're they're like uh, they're like um, like teenage clothes, or they're like a just smaller size, and it's like they're trying to 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 make the little girl grow up faster, you know. And the the, the boy clothes they look geeky and dorky and dumb and nerdy, and pra praise the Lord for that, you know. Amen. If you're if you're ten years old, dress like a ten year old, and then you got a ten year old girl, she's trying to you know dress up with I don't know what you know whatever you wear, whatever and leggings or skirts or whatever, dress them like a kid. Keep them like a like a kid with flowers and little unicorns or something like that. Wear wear a unicorn shirt instead of some, you know, everything got to be perfect. A jean jacket with the little. They're trying to make them like little, you know, little models or something like that. That's I don't think that's that's right. Okay, now look at First Timothy chapter. Look at First Timothy chapter two. We're talking about the physical first. First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two, verse number nine. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. We're going to go to the old Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul is going to tell how to women to how tell you women how to dress. <laughs> and that's the thing. You think of, of you know women these days want wants to take advice from old Apostle Paul and old Peter. <laughs> but listen to what Paul says here. It's a man of God. First Tim First Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9. And I like verse number 8, too. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Like, it starts with prayer. Right? Prayer. And then, in like manner also, so a woman ought to pray. Same thing, advice goes with the, with the woman also. But then he says this about the woman. In like, in like manner also, that woman, women adorn all right, adorn themselves in modest apparel. All right, modest is that which does not attract excessive attention. Okay, because one of the greatest temptations that any woman is going to have 
is to, is, is to face the temptation of trying to attract excessive attention. And uh, women are known to go above and beyond to try to get a man to look at them. And if you're a Christian woman, then your apparel, it ought to be modest. And um, the old, old saying, that's true, I, I believe with this one, it says you, cannot, you can't legislate spirituality. Okay, I mean, you can't enforce standards in dress codes because that alone won't do any good. Okay, uh, Modesty, that stuff can be mimicked. But holiness, true holiness, it starts first in the heart, like Jesus said. Okay, you got to first cleanse the inside before we take care of the outside. Just in this sense, I'm, I, I reversed the change of garments. I'm talking about changing our outside first, but the inside, uh, because this is this is the, the the part that's harder to preach. The second part's a little bit easier. Um, so uh, you know, churches they're trying to um, enforce dress codes on their congregants and. You know, that won't work. And we're talking about ladies here. And, you know, ladies will try to, to draw attention to themselves one way or another, even if it, despite how modest that they may think uh, that they're dressing. Because this is a big topic. You know, people say, well, look, uh, a lady, you can only wear a dress. Ladies only, only wear dresses. And then you got to determine the length of the dress. You know, and then you got to determine the thickness of material. Then you got to determine the color of the dress. And, all this stuff. So when it comes down to it, and the ladies are only allowed to wear jean skirts and a black shirt. Okay, a jean skirt, black shirt, and um, but at the end of the day, they're they're find a way, some other way, to gain excessive attention. All right, they got the jean skirt, they got the black shirt, but then they got some big bow tie in their hair, you know, or some big ginormous flower, or they come in with a big hat on, or they got bright red high heels on, or something. They're they're trying to find a way to get excessive attention elsewhere, you know, or. They come in, they smell like perfume and, you know, fumigate the entire place or something. If a lady wants attention, she's going to find ways to get attention. Despite how you got the whole holiness attire on, they're, they're still find a way, though. Now, shamefacedness. Look what it says here in the next part. That they adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness, okay, in sobriety. Now, shamefacedness, you know, Shakespeare, he knew exactly what that meant when he, Shakespeare said, conscience is a blushing, shamefaced spirit. The word meant bashful with extreme modesty, shamefacedness, okay? Uh, you know, not in a face, not, not a face that, you know, she comes in and, you know, I know I look good. I know I'm beautiful. I know I'm the most beautiful girl in the room type like that, head up high, that, you know, Shame face ain't being in the sense of being ashamed of how you look and, you know, uh, you know I'm ugly and shame. That's not what it's talking about, you know, shame faceness. It's just, it's bashful. Uh, it's, it's, it's humbling in a sense. Um, not like, you know, a, a, a bold face that you're just, you just know, trying to seek, uh, excessively seeking to attract uh, attention, okay? And that says sober, you know, sober, sobriety. A clear or sober conscience in line with the Word of God concerning what you're wearing. And he says there, modest apparel, shamefacedness, and sobriety. All right, you got a clear conscience, you know, and like we talked about before, first, the prayer closet. All right, you walk in the closet, Lord, what am I going to wear? You pray first. All right, and does this please you? Okay, you go through that. And, and at the end of the day, you throw on something that, you know, you wore in high school or you walked around. You got a clear conscience about that. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, um, you got to have a clear conscience. It has to be in line with what the Word of God says about what you're wearing. Then the next part of that says, not with braided hair. No, uh, or, or braided. Okay, not with braided hair. And it says, or gold. Now, here's the part. Now, uh, a braid, you think about it, a braid's a very practical way to keep, you know, a lady's hair tied up. Throw the thing up, braid it or whatever, hold your hair from not coming in your face and stuff. Now, that's that's different. Now, what the Romans, they did back in the day, these Roman women, they'd braid up their hair like a big updo or whatever. They'd braid this big thing up and they'd stick a bunch of gold in it. They'd, they'd plate it. They'd put all these little, you know, them, it's almost like a crown. It's almost like the hair was like some type of crown. And it's it's excessive. It's excessive. And... um. You know, the, the, the holiness people, there's a group of people out there, they would teach that, you, you know, you couldn't be saved, you couldn't be saved if you, um, if you wore jewelry, 
So what do women do? They all laid the jewelry down at the altar, gave up all their jewelry. Uh, you know, and, and you couldn't be saved if you had short hair, and you couldn't be saved if you, you know, you had to grow your hair down all the way down to the floor and stuff like that. And um, you know, one of the holiness ladies, she told her husband, you know, that, that the preacher told me that the Lord told him to get rid of my my wedding ring. And then the husband said, you know, you, the, the Lord told me to punch that preacher in the face for saying such a thing. <laughs> Because what a, what a messed up thing. You know, that's why I try to stay out of stuff like that. I, I ain't got no business telling another person's wife on, oh, so and so, look at you, she was dressing and stuff. I don't, I don't do that. I just let the word of God, you know, that's, that's your own personal thing. I can't enforce all these dress codes and stuff like that uh, on you. You got to take it up with the Lord. But, um, you, know, the, you know, think about that. The audacity of that, that preacher to tell a woman she can't wear, you know, gold. You know, I, I got to throw out my wedding ring, throw out the, I mean, come on, that's, that's crazy. And it's like with the, it's like the Lord, he really pulled a joke on the holiness people back in the 1970s when he rose up the, the rock and roll, drug dealing, fornicating people, hippies that wore long dresses and long hair. And they were the most unspiritual people that you could ever, you could ever get around. So sometimes you got the long hair and you got the dresses, everything's right. You know, you got the outward right, but. Inwardly, they're just as dead and just as unspiritual as, you know, a, a bum on the side of the road or something like that. So, uh, you know, or sometimes a bum on the side of the road would be more spiritual and, and you know, they're dressing in rags or something like that. So, um, in order to make the necessary changes on our garments on the outside, we have to first, we have to first put on something that's in the inside. Come to Ephesians. It's all, this all takes place in the closet. And I like where it should take place with first. It takes place first with prayer. Then, Lord, what are we wearing? But then there's another thing about it. There's the spiritual side of it, okay? Now, that first off, that was the physical, that was the physical trouble, all right? Now, some of you ladies may not have, have to deal with that or, you know, have stuff in the closet that, that is no good. Um, so good for you, amen, praise the Lord. But uh, some ladies, they, they may struggle with that. So that's things you got to deal with about you and God. Now, look at Ephesians chapter 4, all right? We're talking about the spiritual, Ephesians 4.20. Ephesians 4.20. Um, but ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, being renewed in the spirit of your mind, and ye put in that ye put on the new man, which is created after God and created, uh, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, not fake holiness. Just putting on a, you know, my attire, my dress, or my suit and tie, or whatever. That's fake holiness. But putting on the new man. So uh, I like that because the former conversation, you got to take off something. Okay, the old man. That's something that you have to do. You have to put in effort uh, to to change our garments. Um, in the former conversation, that's the former manner of how we lived our life before we came to Christ, the, the old man. And uh, that ought to be put away in the closet, never to be pulled back out again. You know, like a guy, he got, I don't know, a guy's got ugly sweaters or something like that. Keep that thing in the closet, don't ever pull the thing out. A woman, you may got a nice, ugly, or an ugly dress or whatever, you, don't, you know, you don't wear it, you like it, and you know it's ugly. Keep that thing in the closet. There's some things that you got to just keep in the closet. One of the things is um, is the old man that ought to go and stay in the closet. And um, while, you're, like I said, like we talked about, while you're in the closet, it wouldn't hurt to pray in the closet. Okay. Now, instruction number four. Instruction number four. I got a couple more minutes here. Instruction four. Go back to Genesis. Let's look at let's look at this in, in order here. As Jacob gave these instructions, look at Genesis. Genesis 35. Look at Genesis 35. Number one, put away strange gods that are among you. Number two, be clean. Number three, change your garments. Um, number four, let us arise and go up to Bethel. I like that. Let us arise and go up to Bethel. Now, Bethel in the Hebrew language means house of God. That's what Bethel means. And uh, you know, as we try to obey those previous instructions... You know, what naturally follows is that we ought to want to go to the house of God. We get rid of the strange gods. 
we, we're trying to be clean, we're changing our garments, the next step that we ought to take is, I want to go to the house of God now. <laughs> I want to go fellowship with the brethren. I, knew, I, I want to, you know, go to church. Okay, that's all we, we, we're saying in the practical use there. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, 25. I heard this one time and time again. Hebrews 10, 25. Um, I believe there's a warning here. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, and, and you know, some will. Some will forsake assembling. I don't know, maybe they preserve their life or something like that even. Uh, um, they, they just don't, they don't want to meet. They're, you know, that, that's strange. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. They're not meeting. They're not assembling. I got no, no fellowship there. But, but we'll see, he gives the contrary. But exhorting one another, stirring up one another, that's what we need. We need that's why we need preaching and teaching and, and getting in the place. And I understand online's good. You know, I just watch it online. Just sit home and sit on the couch, and get my pop away, all that stuff. And in the comfort of my own home, I could just watch preaching. You got to be careful with that. You know, and, and I, I'm, I got to get this, you know, pre watching preaching and stuff. This isn't just some like hobby or, inner, you know, I'm just watching a sports game. You're hearing it, but we ought to try to be doing it, you know. And um, we need that exhortation of, of, you know, coming together and, and just hearing the word of God just even being spoken. Uh, we need that. We need exhortation one another by assembling of ourselves. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, and, and uh, we're, we're living in the last days that um, times are going to get hard, times are going to get rough. And, uh, but when it comes to living a victorious and fruitful Christian life, number one, we need Christ. Number two, we need each other. I mean, we, that's what we need each other. We need the body of Christ like we talked about with the gifts and all that. And We, we cannot do this alone. No man fights this war alone. Okay, You come to church. Now, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Just Ephesians 4, 11. He gave some and he gave some apostles. And this is talking about what the Lord did, okay? He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What are, what are they all for? Look what it says, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what, those, that's what all those were given for. And, and we need that, okay? And we need to push each other. We got to, you know, try to strive to be better Christians as we were than last year. And uh, anybody that works out or something, most of the time they're more committed when they got a gym buddy. I was at least, you know. Trying to get, get your personal, you know, best and stuff like that when I had a partner with me, okay? I always uh, did better with that. Anybody that trains for sports, they train with a team. Okay, and then they do their own personal stuff. I got that too. But any soldier that trains for battle, they, they train with fellow soldiers. That's what we ought to do. So the point is we need, we need each other. All right, we, we need each other. And like what Jacob says, he says, let us arise. Let us arise, rise up, and go up to Bethel and go to church. That will be faithful, faithful to our church, you know. That's a, that's a blessing. Um, a, a, a local church, you know, is, is a blessing. They're even going on a mission trip and stuff, you know, little shacks and stuff, little plastic chairs, you know, broken holes in it. But they're fine, you know, it's, it's fine. they got a place to meet. And I tried telling them that down there. And a, a local church is a blessing. You know, stay faithful to the church. Stay faithful to, that, to the, your pastor and stuff. You know, he watches over your souls and stuff. And it's good to see just a, a church in, a, in, in villages like that. Um, you know, any, any opportunity you get to spend time in church, sing praises, pray to God, sit under the preaching and teaching of God's book. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. Almost done. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, you almost look at church, you know, this is where we praise, where we praise. Uh, it's where we like practice. You know, it's our practice facility. It's our barracks. You get back to barracks. Get back to you know boot camp type stuff. Uh, that's what, it, what church is all there for. Now look at First Timothy chapter three verse fifteen. First Timothy three 
15. But if I tarry long, Paul's talking about it, now that thou mayest know, talking to Timothy, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Good behavior in the house of God. Okay? Which is the church of the living God. Now I understand this verse in the house of God, spiritual. How we ought to behave in the how you behave in church, you don't just behave like this in church one way and you walk out the door and behave a, a complete different way. You know, I just you know how many people know a person like that or two or three or four or thousand. I mean, come on. You come into church, you're one person, ah, hi, I love you, I love you, Debbie, give me a hug, give me a kiss, I'll pray for you and all that. You walk out the door to mean as the devil. I mean, you know you know people like that, all right? So Paul, he's saying, I, I, you that knows how I ought to behave myself in the house of God. We'll say, okay, we'll go for practical instruction. It's the church. Then he says, which is the church of the living God, the body of Christ, the pillar and ground of truth. And he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And he gets on about God's manifest in the flesh. So we ought to know how to act in church. And how we act in church is how we ought to act in our everyday life. Okay? Like I said, this, this is uh, you, you take your training, you take your practice, and you go out and do the things that were said. Okay. Now, last thing here, and I like this last little one. Let's look back to Genesis. Come to Genesis here. Genesis 35 again. I'm almost done. Last instruction. And it's interesting that he. It's like he he he, he saved the best for last here. All right. Look at look at Gen Genesis 35. All right, verse number, uh, verse 2, put away strange gods, be clean, change your garments, rise, go up to Bethel. All right, um, let, let's read the rest of it. And I will make there an altar unto God. So laying it at the altar. Now what is this? Who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob, Look at this. His household listened. His family listened to the man of God in the house. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. That ought to be even talk about Rachel. Remember Rachel carried away her, her dad's gods and stuff like that? The whole household. The strange gods which were in their hand. And look. And all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob, look what he did hid them under the oak. <laughs> he hid them under a tree. He put all these fake false gods, all these idols, all their sin, he laid it at the foot of an oak tree. <laughs> what could possibly that indicate? That's us taking all of our burdens, all of our iniquities, all of our stuff, and laying it at the foot of the cross. <laughs> he laid it at the oak tree. We ought to go lay it down, lay it on the altar, and give it all to God. You know, lay, lay it at the cross. Okay, And that's the whole thing. Is, uh, you know, we're going to struggle, we're going to fail. We have trouble obeying all these instructions which we talked about. But what we need to do, and it's interesting, you know, that was the last thing. A little hidden subliminal thing there at the end, laying it at the oak. We ought to do that every day. Be number one, laying it all at the cross. And I uh, like that hymn we sing, you know, Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he will guide us till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. And another hymn we sing, I must tell Jesus... I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. And, um, you know, if, if you, I know everybody sitting here, we're, we're saved, and we got promises He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Um, and, and all of our sins can be forgiven. All of We can have fellowship with Him if we just take all those things, you know, whether it be uh, your false gods and what you're wearing or your clothes or uh, any sins and iniquities that become a stumbling block in our relationship with the Lord to put it at his cross okay we would we need to lay it lay them under the yoke now look at first corinthians 1 18 i got just two verses first corinthians 1 18 first corinthians 1 18 um first corinthians 1 18 you talk about the cross because that's that's where our victory is at that's where it's at first corinthians 1 18 
We cannot forget about this as a Christian in our daily walk and when it comes to confessing our sins and praying and all that practical stuff. And Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. People are going to hell. They think it's a joke and stuff like that. The preaching of the cross to those types of people, it's foolishness. They're going to go to hell because they, they, that's, that's what they think about it. But unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. The cross has power. It is the power of God unto us that are saved. The, cro the cross has power in our life. Back 2,000 years ago, in the blood atonement, it still atones. The blood of Jesus, it still cleanses. All that stuff is still in effect. It's still alive. It still is present that we could apply in, in our spiritual walk with God. I'm just going to read a couple verses. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord... He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Then Matthew 11, the Lord says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's a blessing. Now Genesis chapter 35, to, to end that, he, he put, he, they hid all that under the yoke. That's what we got to do. We, our life is hidden in Christ Jesus. We got to lay everything at the cross. Remember the cross. It's powerful. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed in the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. <laughs> then people started noticing and realizing, man, this guy got victory. This guy is a, what, what's the, something different about him. He's a new creature, new, all that. They, 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 they it's like, they, the, uh, they journeyed, there was a terror of God upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. I'm leaving them people alone. I'm not even, I'm afraid to even mess with them because he's so, he's plugged into God. I don't want, I don't want to get close to him. I don't want to mess with him. And uh, you don't got to turn there, but that reminds me of Psalms 23. Um, you know, the, the cities, the cities that were what? Round about them. Enemies on all sides. In Psalm chapter 23, verse number, uh, verse number um, uh, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, shall, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me. I could have fellowship with Jesus Christ at table, sitting down with the table, taking the Lord's Supper, communion, me and Christ, me and the Lord, right there. Presence of my enemies, uh, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In the midst of people all round about them, but yet you could find peace, you could have victory, you could, uh, I mean, it's amazing. Thou anointest my head with oil, type of the Holy Spirit, my cup runneth over. You know, where, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And uh, the, the, the Holy Ghost of God, you know, to, to, be, to keep praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're sealed, thank God, but we need a good filling of it. And that, so all those instructions are just to go through one, one more time. Put away strange gods. Be clean. Change your garments. Rise, go up to Bethel. I'll make an altar of God. Lay it all under the oak. Lay it all under the cross. All right, let's bow our heads. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the instruction that we could find in, in all these, uh, these stories, Lord, from Jacob and his household and how we could apply them to us, Lord, who are the household of God. Um, how we apply all these things, Lord, physically and spiritually to our lives. We know that there's things that you know about us, Lord, that only you know. And uh, people set up, we set up idols and, and false gods in our hearts, Lord. I pray that you help us break those things down like they did in the Old Testament. Break them and smash them. And Moses, he scattered all the dust in the air and, and stuff like that. We got That's what we got to do, Lord, in our heart. And Lord, we need some cleansing. We need to get clean through your word. We need a, we need a constant application uh, of your blood to us. And just a, a, a constant life of reading our Bibles, Lord, that you speak to us and cleanse our minds and renew us. And Lord, just help us with our, um, with our appearance. We know, Lord, first, like you said, first, clean the inside. And then the outside, Lord, you know, to be, to be clean, to live a good, decent, 
orderly life, um, to, to try to dress appropriate, um, you know, help us get away any, any bad, wrong clothes that, that may not please you. Help us uh, get rid of anything that defiles the prayer closet that may be found in our closet. Uh, so help us with that, Lord. Help us change our garments, put on a new man. And Lord, I'm just, um, just very thankful for church, Lord. I, I can't believe it, Lord. I'm just so thankful to be able to preach and teach your book. Uh, you've been very good to me, Lord, and I just thank you. I thank you for all your, all the people, Lord, all the, the great fellowship, and, um, and and just all the everybody that supports this church, Lord, and all the prayers. And I'm just so thankful, Lord. It's good to good to have a place to worship and, and praise you. And Lord, I just um, last but not least, I'm thankful for the cross. And help us, Lord, just lay all of our burdens down to you, and um, help us just claim victory. And there's power at the cross, Lord. The cross is powerful. Help us uh, keep that in memory and uh, lay it all on the altar, Lord. And um, we all know what, what we have in our hearts. So I just pray that we all think about that and speak to you, Lord, and apply these things to our daily life. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Um, Julie, if you could click add, we'll do verse memorization.